Hey, John Scott. Uh, we'll do a little mic check here. Microphone check, testing one, two. Microphone check, testing one, two. Microphone check, testing one, two, three, four. Cool. Testing one, two, three, four. Testing one. Testing one, two, three, four. Testing. Right. Share screen, thanks.
Microphone check, testing one, two. Microphone check, testing one, two, three. Microphone check, testing one, two. Microphone check, testing one, two, three. Again, we're doing a microphone check for the engineering. Microphone check, testing one, two, three. Microphone check, testing one, two. Microphone check, testing one, two. One more level check. Hopefully this will be good. Microphone check, testing one, two. Mic check, testing one, two. Mic check, testing one, two. Better, better. Mic check, testing one, two.
Ladies and gentlemen, we're waiting for a camera crew that's en route, so we're going to start in about five minutes. Um, please enjoy the, the coffee, the tea, the breakfast, and we'll get started shortly. Microphone check testing one, two. Microphone check testing one, two. Microphone check testing one, two, three, four. Microphone check.
two, one, two, one, two. Check, check, check. One, two, one, two. John, I hope you're listening to this because this is the only check we're going to be able to get before you start. One, two, one, two. I had to make sure that it didn't start squealing when we turned it up later. Hello. It's my great pleasure to welcome you today to Lynn versus the United States and the Republic of China Press Conference. Today we're going to hear from Mrs. Julian Lin as well as Mr. Charles Camp. Um, I'd like to begin by introducing uh, Mrs. Lin, if I may, and then I'll turn the podium over to her. So Mrs. Julian T.A. Lin was born in Taiwan. She grew up in a native Taiwanese family. Her parents are just victims of the ROC's 1946 international decrees. Since her childhood, she has witnessed many unequal treatments of the people of Taiwan and wished one day that she could improve the justice for the Taiwanese people. After she married Dr. Roger Lin, she became a volunteer to fight for human rights for the people of Taiwan. Over the past 60 years, the inhabitants of Taiwan were in political purgatory. They have lived without any uniformly recognized government and nationality. She refuses to continually endure the ROC's unfair treatments that the people of Taiwan have been suffering from after World War II. This time, Mrs. Julian Lin and her husband together sue the United States and the Republic of China in order to relieve Taiwan from the regime violating the human rights. Eventually, the goal is to achieve the normalization of the Taiwan international status. May I please introduce Mrs. Julian Lin. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Julian Lin. It is my honor to make these brief remarks to you and all the world. On behalf of myself, my husband, Dr. Roger Lin, and the 30,000 members of the Taiwan civil government, which filed a lawsuit for a, for a declaratory judgment on February 27, 2015, in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia. Our lawsuit was filed here in Washington 
when it was February 28th in Taiwan. That day is the National Day of Mourning and the Remembrance by the people of Taiwan of what is known as the 22A incident or 22A massacre. Beginning on February 27, 1947, Taiwanese protesters were violently suppressed by the KMT led Republic of China. When the killing began on February 28th, many thousands of civilians lay day. This is how the KMT's white terror period in Taiwan began, a period in which thousands more disappeared. The 22A massacre is one of the most important and personal events in our modern Taiwanese history. When my husband, friends, my co-workers, and I think of these events of the past, we think of also of our present. When we think of our desire to no longer be stateless, in 1946, the ROC nationality decrees imposed upon the people of Taiwan without the consent of the people of Taiwan, a nationality of the Republic of China. This is a nationality that he never offered the people of Taiwan an internationally accepted nationality. We seek a declaration that the nationality decrees of 1946 violated international law, illegally depriving the plaintiffs of a recognized nationality. We seek a declaration that the nationality decrees of 1946 were delivered and enforced without the authority of the United States. We seek a declaration that the nationality decrees of 1946 stripping the people of Taiwan of their Japanese nationality and imposing a nationality of ROC are invalid. Our fight is the district court here in Washington, D.C. It's about decrees that were enacted decades ago that violated international law and have affected our lives every day ever since. On a human level, this lawsuit is about the personal identities of my friends and family, my co-workers and organizations members, and all the people of Taiwan in this world. We do not have a nationality that, of, that affords us the same basic privileges as most of the citizens of this world. We do not have a nationality that we or our parents or grandparents were able to have a say in. Imagine that. Going to bed with one nationality and waking up with a new one, being told, no, you cannot keep your home and the identity you once had, being told, no, this new identity that you never asked for, never agreed to is not settled, cannot be settled anytime soon, being told, nearly everyone else in this world may have a nationality that allows him or her the opportunity to travel freely and then to come home and to belong. But you cannot. There is the basic sense of not belonging completely anywhere. And we have lived with this now for generations. It is frustrating and painful to know that we are in this situation, 
because of a decision made so many years ago to change an entire population's national identity overnight. It is frustrating and painful to know that we have international rights that are supposed to protect us and our families and let the decision to take away an entire population's nationality has been allowed to stand to hold us for so many years. These international protections are very important to us, and I will lead you now just one of them. As it is written, Article 15 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, first, everyone has the right to a nationality. Second, no one should be arbitrarily deprived of his nationality, nor denied the right to change his nationality. I am proud to stand here today and represent our fight to invalidate these nationality degrees. I am proud to stand here today and represent our fight to exercise our right of self-determination to determine for ourselves and uh, our national identity is. There are many wrongs, many tragedies of the past which may cause us pain even today, but which we cannot undo. The nationality degrees of 1946 are a real kind of wrong, injustice, which we believe can be undone. We intend now to fight to undo them. God bless American. God bless Taiwanese. Thanks for all your coming, and please support human rights for us. Thank you very much. I will now introduce Mr. Charles H. Camp, attorney for the plaintiffs. For those of you that are following along internationally, we have a live feed running, ladies and gentlemen. At the conclusion of Mr. Camp's remarks, we will have our question and answer period, and you may tweet questions to us that we'll ask from around the world. And of course, please, questions from the audience. For over 30 years, Mr. Camp's law practice has focused on resolving complex international commercial disputes including recovering significant debts owed by foreign interests to foreign and domestic clients. Following practicing law to large international law firms for 20 years, Mr. Camp opened his own firm in October 2002 to focus exclusively on international dispute resolution. Mr. Camp has been engaged to resolve numerous international disputes through litigation, arbitration, and negotiation. Mr. Camp has taught international negotiation for 10 years as an adjunct professor at George Washington University Law School. He also taught international negotiation seminars at Tecnologio de Monterrey, the largest private university in Mexico, and recently received an appointment to teach international negotiations in the MBA program at Louisiana State University. In addition to prosecuting the case we're here to discuss today, Mr. Camp currently is representing large judgment creditors against the Republic of Honduras and the People's Republic of China, prosecuting an ICC arbitration in London on behalf of a California health company against Malaysian and Saudi Arabian-based companies, enforcing a Swiss arbitral award on behalf of Swiss educational institution against a US-based US nonprofit, and enforcing a federal court judgment against a large mainland China company negotiating resolution of a claim against the government of the Republic of Sierra Leone. Quite a bit there. Mr. Camp has collected significant sums owed to his foreign and domestic clients, including a, including a major Kuwaiti bank and one of the largest Japanese trading companies. Mr. Camp has collected significant sums from companies and individuals based in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Netherlands Antilles, and the United States and frozen approximately 85 million US dollars of Iraqi funds hidden in the Bahamas. 
Likewise, Mr. Camp has obtained nearly one billion in judgments against various Iraqi state-owned entities on behalf of 20 banks and financial institutions based in Bahrain, England, France, Kuwait, Switzerland, Tunisia, and the United Arab Emirates. Mr. Camp also currently serves as a member of the Meridian International Center's Board of Trustees, Executive Committee, Compensation Committee, Audit Committee, and Chair of its Governance and Nominating Committee, President of the Georgetown Business Association, and is past President of the Washington Foreign Law Society, and Friends of the Law Library of Congress. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Camp, and of course, we'll have questions after. Thank you very much, Kay, for that very generous introduction. I appreciate everybody being here today to learn more about this case. I want to acknowledge the 35 people that came here from Taiwan just to come to this press conference and see it live. They're all members of the Taiwan civil government, and I've met them before in Taiwan, and they're all um, uh, really incredible people that are just uh, seeking a right and justice in this world. And uh, Julian Lin uh, is a wonderful client to have, along with her husband and the Taiwan civil government. Um, and uh, I've represented them in the first uh, Dr. Lin case against the U.S. several years ago, uh, involving different issues, but, all, but involving Taiwan. And it's my honor to be here uh, again uh, to tell you about the case we filed on the 27th of February. Uh, this, this lawsuit raises broad questions about nationality rights under international law. The ultimate goal of the plaintiffs is to obtain for the people of Taiwan the right to exercise their right of self-determination, a right guaranteed by the UN Charter, numerous treaties, so that statelessness, as Julian said, will one day no longer exist for the people of Taiwan. While the lawsuit is complicated in many respects, it's based on simple principles of principle and agent. As I'll explain in a minute, in all relevant times to this lawsuit, the United States was the supreme allied force. This was back in the, this is back in World War II days. The U.S. was the, uh, General MacArthur was the supreme allied commander and the United States forces were the supreme allied forces. There were numerous allied forces, but we were the, the uh, top Allied force. I call them the supreme allied force. Um, after uh, Japan was defeated, Formosa, which is now known as Taiwan, uh, was uh, we put uh, General Chiang Kai-shek and his nationalist Chinese party uh, in charge of form, uh, Taiwan, Formosa, um, to administer it for us. As you know, the great question in the world that still exists is who owns Taiwan? And that's an, that's an open question that hasn't yet been decided and will be decided at some future time when there is a new treaty uh, saying who owns Taiwan. The reason the ROC is not recognized as the owner is because there's never been a treaty saying that the Republic of China is the owner of Taiwan. And so, but at the end of World War II, General MacArthur, who had befriended Chiang Kai-shek, because Chiang Kai-shek at the same time as World War II was fighting the communists in mainland China. And so Chiang Kai-shek and two million of his followers were fleeing mainland China, and they landed in Formosa. And General MacArthur thought, well, you know, our troops want to go home. We don't want to administer Formosa uh, directly. So we basically hired uh, Chiang Kai-shek to administer uh, Formosa for us, Taiwan. Um, and, and, it's, and that was a situation that was to continue until the question was answered, who owns Taiwan? And that question has never been answered. And so it was Chiang Kai-shek and his Chinese Nationalist Party, which is now the, the, the ROC. So, you know, the ROC does not own Taiwan. The ROC is just the successor to Chiang Kai-shek that was put in charge of, of running Taiwan until it was decided who owns it. And so there was a principal agent relationship between Chiang Kai-shek and his party and the United States. The U.S. was the principal and the agent was, the, was Chiang Kai-shek and, and his party. And so the lawsuit is, uh, and well, 
to go uh, to the next step. The first thing Chiang Kai-shek did when he was put in charge uh, to administer it as our agent was he passed two laws that Julian mentioned that took away the Japanese citizenship of everybody living in Formosa and replaced it with ROC nationality. Remember, Formosa was Japanese since 1895 when Japan defeated China, or the ROC, in a war. And there was a treaty in 1895, and it was that treaty that made Formosa part of Japan. Well, so it was, Formosa was Japanese from 1895 until Japan was defeated in World War II. But Chiang Kai-shek was unhappy that China had lost the war to Japan. And so he passed these nationality laws to make everybody that was Japanese Chinese, ROC, which is not recognized. It wasn't recognized then as a nationality and it's not recognized now as a nationality. In the Dr. Lin case, the first case I brought, the U.S. District Court here held that the U.S., that, that um, the people of Taiwan are stateless. And, and the uh, D.C. Circuit, you know, affirmed that they're stateless. Um, so, you know, that situation, uh, it continues to this day. And so, this lawsuit is about invalidating those laws that were put into place by the U.S.'s agent, um, and they were not authorized by the U.S. government. The U.S. was the principal, remember. They were the principal, the ROC government, Chiang Kai-shek, they were our agent. And as soon as the, and the U.S. government, they knew that these laws were going to go into effect, and they didn't stop them. But after they went into effect, the British government sent a long and detailed document to Chiang Kai-shek to say, you didn't have authority to change the nationality of the people from Japanese to Chinese. And then the U.S. government followed up with a similar letter saying that for all the reasons the British government stated, you know, you didn't have authority to change the, the Japan, you know, take away the Japanese citizenship. So, um, you know, the UN Charter and other uh, laws, treaties, um, such as the uh, Ar Article 15 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that Julian mentioned, everyone has the right of, to a nationality. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of their nationality nor denied the right. To change, their uh, to cha change their nationality. The UN Charter states that its purpose is to develop friendly relations among nations based on respect for the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples and to take other measures to strengthen universal peace. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a document which supplements the definition of fundamental freedoms and human right in the UN Charter and contains obligations of all members of the international community to all persons. Likewise, the 1961 Convention on the Reduction of Statelessness also reflects customary international law on the subject of individual and, collect and the collective right to determine one's own nationality. Article 7, paren 6 of the 1961 Convention articulates the basic international norm that a person shall not lose their nationality if such a loss would render him stateless. It's not like Chiang Kai-shek said, okay, we're gonna cancel your Japanese citizenship and we're gonna make you citizens of the United States or France or any other recognized nation. There, there would be, that would be a different situation, but he, he took away the Japanese citizenship and replaced it with NA, doesn't exist. So they, you know, they, you just can't do that. And, and there is no case um, that I'm aware of that says that you can just cancel someone's nationality without their consent. And the people of Taiwan have never been allowed to determine their own nationality. The ROC government in place didn't give them that choice. The only way they can change their nationality like anybody in the world is they leave. You have to leave. You can go to Japan. You can go somewhere else. You know, you can become a citizen of a different country. But the people living in Taiwan have never had 
have had that luxury. That fund it's not a luxury, it's a fundamental right. And they've never had that. And the purpose of this is to declare that the nationality laws violate international law, were put into place um, without the authority of the principal, the United States government, um, and that they're invalid and ineffective. So they're invalid and ineffective, and they were done without our authorization. And so that's what we're asking for. So the, um, now I mentioned, just to step back for a second, uh, General MacArthur is the Supreme Allied Commander in the US government, put Chiang Kai-shek in charge of Taiwan to administer it. For example, um, our government, uh, well, General MacArthur, but this was approved by, uh, specifically approved by President Truman. Um, General Chiang Kai-shek, uh, he first began acting on behalf of the US pursuant to what's called General Order Number One, which was approved August 17, 1945 by President Truman, and it ordered Japanese commanders and ground and sea and air and auxiliary forces within Formosa and elsewhere to surrender to General Chiang Kai-shek. It wasn't that General Chiang Kai-shek was the Supreme Allied Commander. He was there because we asked him to do this for us. So, you know, that's the kind of power that we, we gave him as our agent, but he wasn't in charge. He was never intended to be fully in charge. He just was supposed to act on our behalf, pursuant to our instructions. He was acting on behalf of our government, pursuant to this general order number one. Likewise, uh, and pursuant to that same uh, order, on October 25th, 1945, representatives of Sh uh, General Chiang Kai-shek as agent of the US, which was the Supreme Allied Force, um, accepted the surrender of the Japanese commanders. So he was authorized to do it and then he did it. Likewise, while acting as the agent of the US, he promulgated these nationality laws that I talked about. But he wasn't authorized to do that. Just like, you know, General Order Number One, General Chiang Kai-shek was specifically authorized and directed to accept the surrender. There was never any similar law authorizing or directing Chiang Kai-shek to pass these nationality laws to take away the Japanese citizenship of the people of Taiwan. And he was rebuked for that by the British government, which was an allied force, and by us as well. So the ROC nationality decrees imposed upon the people of Taiwan without the express or implied consent of the people of Taiwan uh, they became ROC nation nationals that to this day do not offer the people of Taiwan an internationally accepted nationality. So the plaintiffs acting on, behalves of the, on behalf of themselves and the thousands of members, there are 30,000 members of the Taiwan civil government and it grows every day. This lawsuit is brought on behalf of all of those people, many of whom ha had, were, there are uh, many members of the TCG that are of the generation where they were the direct victims. You know, they were Japanese citizenship. They were Japanese uh, citizens and they were stripped and then there are their descendants. So the people who personally had their um, nationality taken away, the Japanese citizenship and their descendants, they would have all been Japanese, but for this nationality law. So to this day, the people of Taiwan are without a state that's the finding of the U.S. Uh, courts here in Washington. And to this day, in a circumstance of, of continually trying to concretely define their national identity. So that's what this lawsuit is about, is to help the people of Taiwan be able to finally exercise their right of self-determination so that they can determine their own national identity. This is not about making Taiwan independent. This isn't about making Taiwan a part of another country. This is simply about the rights of the citizens, the, peop the people, I should say, living in Taiwan to be able to determine who they are. What is their national identity? What is their nationality? And that's something they've never been given the right to. They were Japanese, it was taken away, and they've never had the option of 
voting or in, in any sort of civilized way ever. Who, you know, what do we want to be? Do we want to be Japanese? Do we want to be Taiwanese? Do we want to be American? What do we want to be? So that's, that's the point of this, is to finally get the, the right of the people of Taiwan a way for them to be able to exercise the right of self-determination. So I'll be happy to, hope that was reasonably clear, be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm Roy McCall. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, TCG, the Taiwan civil government, the history, how it uh, was formed? And yes, the TCG uh, is is an association formed uh, by Dr. Lin, uh, who is the leader of TCG. It is um, the, uh, it is an organization that aspires um, to well, it it is an organization created to help the people of Taiwan do exactly what we're doing in this lawsuit. Um, I don't know the exact date of the, date of the formation. Um, it is not a government in itself. Um, I say that that is an aspirational name. Um, you can name your organization anything you want. They named it the Taiwan Civil Government, um, and that's how it's known throughout Taiwan. There are 30,000 members. They, they have 60 offices throughout Taiwan, um, and at each one of those offices, they educate the people of Taiwan by the thousands um, on the true history of Taiwan um, because all the history books in Taiwan have been changed by the ROC government. You know, the ROC government uh, has a one China policy. They say that, and this is on the uh, website of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the ROC, they say there is but one China and it is us, the ROC, and we're just choosing at the moment not to govern mainland China. And of course, the mainland China PRC has their own one China policy, which is there is but one China and we're it, and it includes Taiwan. And the US has a one China policy, which says we recognize that the PRC has a one China policy, period. So does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes, sir. One comment about uh, Chiang Kai-shek led uh, two million people to Taiwan. Yes. It's uh, not true, it's a lie. I'm from Taiwan. According to the information I studied about 1975, mm -hmm. the foreign government statistics, about 683,000, uh, 683,000. Not 2 million. Not the 2 million. And I saw some American dictionary and uh, some organization quoting this about 1 million. It's mm -hmm. absolutely less than 2 million, about 681,000. Not according to my best memory. And interesting. Thank That's you. very interesting because um, I, you know, the two million. I'm sure you've seen the two million dollar number in lots of different places, um, and I don't recall offhand exactly uh, the source of the two million um, uh, number that we've used. Um, but that's interesting because um, uh, Dr. Lin um, uh, has information or uh, uh, that. Um, 80% of the people living in Taiwan are actually of Japanese descent. And it makes sense that there would be a lesser number of people from mainland that came with Chiang Kai-shek to Taiwan. So, um, you know, I, in that ex if 80% if of the people in Taiwan are of Japanese descent, it helps you understand better um, why the people of Taiwan are so adamantly opposed to become part of mainland China. Next question, please. I have a Twitter question, if I can interject. Yes. Um, from the international realm, why is this the right time for the lawsuit? It's, it's never too late to try to correct a fundamental wrong. There's no statute of limitations on this sort of an issue, um, the deprivation of rights. This obviously could have been done sooner. Um, there's no deadline for doing it. Uh, I have no explanation for why um, this hasn't um, been pursued previously, uh, but it hasn't been. But we are confident in the facts of the law. We have 
meticulously researched every sentence in the complaint. We have researched to death all the law. We are 100% certain that we are right on the facts and the law. Of course, no one can predict what a court's going to do, but we are absolutely certain in the correctness of our legal positions and the facts that we state in our complaint. So it's never, you know, it, it's never a bad time to try to achieve rights that you have a fundamental right to. Yes, sir. It's not a ten, not eighty percent the Taiwanese. The time. Uh, sir, do you have a question? Okay. What's your question? Oh, question is about the. Uh, they said you know they are about eighty percent the Taiwanese. Uh, the people of Taiwan, 80 percent, they sound correct, about 88.83 percent. So about 90 percent of Taiwanese, not 80 percent Taiwanese. What? Yes. Now the population here in Taiwan, mm -hmm. about 90 percent of the people of Taiwan, 10 percent of Taiwan. I, I understand. I don't want to debate it with you in, 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 this, in this forum. Um, it is true that as more generations come along, they identify themselves as Taiwanese. But when you look behind the title Taiwanese, what's their, what's, you know, who, who are their ancestors? That's what I'm talking about. It's not how do you self-identify yourself today in a poll, are you Taiwanese, Japanese, American, whatever. Um, it's a question of looking at your ancestry um, to see where did you come from. And I know it's, compl it's a complex thing because Taiwan has been Japanese, bef you know, it was Chinese before 1895, you know, so th there is a big mix. But um, my understanding is that 80% of the people there, when you look behind the titles and the names and you look at the genetics, it's, uh, there is Japanese blood there. Next question. Did I do such a good job? Nobody has any questions. Yes, ma'am. How, how long do you anticipate this process will take before you're able to resolve this issue? Um, how long do I think the lawsuit will will take? Um, it's hard to, it's, you're a lawyer, it's hard to be able to predict how long a lawsuit will go. Um, I think this lawsuit will um, take some time. There are a lot of legal issues. There are a lot of facts. I think the facts are not in dispute. In the first lawsuit we brought, the facts were not in dispute. Uh, the first lawsuit just uh, ended on uh, questions of the political question doctrine. I, I think uh, the way we have pled this case, um, the political question doctrine should not be such an issue as it was before. Um, the, uh, the political question doctrine does not, uh, is, is of no benefit to the ROC in this lawsuit. So I would expect uh, this lawsuit to take possibly longer than the first one, um, but you never know. You know, it's, you never know. And, and in the end, uh, this whole situation uh, has to be resolved as a political issue, you know, through, through, ne uh, through negotiations. You know, who owns Taiwan? That's a question of negotiation. That's, and that's not part of this lawsuit. So the ultimate issue of who owns Taiwan and what, are, what is the nationality of the people. We're not asking the court to reinstate the Japanese citizenship of the plaintiffs. We are only asking them to say that the nationality laws uh, violate international law, were not authorized by the U.S. government, uh, and are ineffective. We're not asking the court to reinstate Japanese citizenship. I think that's clearly beyond the power of this court uh, to do that, but they could certainly declare that what was done when the U.S. was the principal, and it's a, you know what was done through its agent uh, violated international law is in, ineffective. If it violates international law, it must be ineffective. I mean, you can't have things that are illegal being effective. Yes, ma'am. Could you elaborate, please, on the difference between this lawsuit and the previous lawsuit? Yes. The first lawsuit asked the, uh, we sought a declaration uh, on behalf of Dr. Lin and, and a, a, a political party, not TCG. Um, we sought a declaration, or we sought to uh, have the court read and interpret the San Francisco Peace Treaty, which ended World War II, 
the U.S. The, the San Francisco Peace Treaty states that the U.S. is the principal occupying power. And our question was, do the people of Taiwan have any fundamental rights under our Constitution by virtue of the fact that the San Francisco Peace Treaty says that the U.S. is the principal occupying power over Taiwan and other areas that were given up, lost uh, by Japan? Um, just one second of uh, legal background on that. Um, uh, there have been a multitude of cases that went to the U.S. Supreme Court stating that when the U.S. is the principal occupying power or the occupier uh, of a land that they won in a war, that the people living there have fundamental rights under our Constitution. And the question of which fundamental rights is, is determined by how closely the U.S. is, uh, how close the U.S. is to the, to the uh, conquered territory and, and all that. So um, our case was well founded. Um, the uh, U.S. District Court said that uh, we were, in their opinion, asking us, asking the, that we were asking the court to uh, determine who owned Taiwan. And as many times as I said, we're not asking you to de determine who owns Taiwan. All we want you to do is read and interpret the treaty and decide whether uh, the people, the plaintiffs, have uh, you know, any constitutional rights. You know, read and interpret the San Francisco Peace Treaty and determine the existence of constitutional rights. It is in the Constitution that courts are the ones to read and interpret treaties. And courts are the, are the entity in the Constitution to determine the existence of constitutional rights. And so that was what we were seeking. But the district court, in a very thoughtful decision, um, uh, she held, the judge held that the people of Taiwan were stateless and she understood their desire to not be stateless, but that she wasn't going to decide Basically, it was above her pay grade uh, to decide who owned Taiwan, and so she dismissed on the political question doctrine solely. I appealed to the uh, U.S. Court of Appeals. They uh, affirmed, but on different grounds, and, and they said, if we were to read and interpret the San Francisco Peace Treaty, we would agree with the appellants that they have these rights. But the political question doctrine prevents us from reading and interpreting the San Francisco Peace Treaty so we'll never know the answer to the question, is what they said. And so I appealed to the Supreme Court on the issue of what, does the political question doctrine trump the obligation of courts to read and interpret treaties and determine the existence of constitutional rights? And the Supreme Court denied cert. So in Washington, the political question trumps everything. Um, th th this case is entirely different. It's not based in any way on a determination that in our view can, requires any determination of who owns Taiwan. It just, it, that's, who owns Taiwan is irrelevant. The only issue is, can you take away somebody's nationality without their consent? And there is no law that says you can. There's not a treaty that says you can. The right of self-determination is one of the most fundamental rights the people of Earth have. You know, and, and the right to not be stateless is another one. And we're, now we're not trying to say that they are, uh, you know, we're not trying to make them not stateless. We're just trying to get them the right to exercise their right of self-determination. And we don't see that as a, as a political question. Courts do, of course, handle political cases all the time. You know, the Senate files cases and, you know, it, I mean, it's just, there's, you know, how many cases in Washington, D.C. filed involve, involve politics? Many, many cases do. Um, uh, but this, the political question doctrine says that courts don't, in essence, decide questions that are left to the political branches. Um, and there's actually a case in the Supreme Court now uh, that's been argued already on whether uh, uh, the executive is the sole, uh, whether the president um, is the only one that has the power, uh, the, uh, say, the pow it's called the power of recognition, to recognize foreign governments, or whether that power is shared uh, by Congress, which is another political branch. Congress believes that the president isn't the sole holder of the uh, power to recognize foreign governments. So um, we just, uh, the short answer to your question is, uh, we, have tr we have tried to craft this complaint as carefully as possible 
to um, avoid the political question doctrine and just make it a question of applying international customary law to these nationality acts that were put in place without our authorization, um, you know, and that remain in effect. Because, the you know, all of that would have been changed. This, this would not be an issue if a later treaty had been entered into that decided who got Taiwan. At the time, they, they did the San Francisco Peace Treaty. They couldn't decide who got Taiwan, and that's why they just gave, it just says Japan gives up all right, title, and claim to Japan, I mean to uh, Taiwan, period. It didn't say like in other parts of the treaty, um, we give it up and it now belongs to X, Y, or Z. Um, in fact, Russia didn't sign the treaty because they wanted Taiwan and they weren't gonna get it uh, and so they refused to sign. So it's, but all this, all these problems arise because it's never been decided. But one thing we can do is we can deal with nationality which is a separate issue from who owns Taiwan. Thank you. Yes, sir, in the red chair. Hi, um, so I understand the legal basis of your case, but um, if the court rules in your favor, are there any like tangible deliverables that you believe you'll achieve? Or is, do you see this case as more symbolic in terms of the Taiwanese right to self-determination? If the, if the court rules uh, in our favor, uh, the plaintiffs would have a solid ground to have, it's called a plebiscite. Um, it's a, basically an election um, overseen by international organizations uh, where the people would uh, be able to vote on what, what, they, you know, what nationality do they want to have. It would, it would you know, the ROC isn't going to allow it uh, if now. I mean, they, they like it the way it is. Um, the ROC, uh, as I mentioned, they, they think they're the only China. Um, so they like it the way it is. Um, uh, the tangible deliverable will be um, once there is a right recognized uh, that they have the right to, you know, exercise the right of self-determination, then it's just a question of who's going to oversee that process. In other, the UN has, has overseen that process uh, uh, in other instances when the government, you know, the so-called government um, uh, wouldn't allow it. I don't know if that is a possibility here because of uh, who's on the Security Council. But there is a way to do it. Um, but the first step is to get a determination that they have this right, um, that, that uh, you know, and, and it, it'll, it will uh, lead to negotiations. It could lead to other actions. Um, but it's sort of the first step on this long road. So it, it does give tangible results, but it's not gonna, you're not gonna get the uh, end result you want just through this one lawsuit. Yes? You mentioned that the citizenship of Taiwan people uh, was taken, uh, taken away and replaced by NA. You say it's not an internationally accepted uh, nationality. I wonder how you define that. I mean, yeah, uh, obviously it's not a member of the UN, but its citizens has every right to like travel in the world or has its own passport. How would you define that it's not an internationally accepted nationality or citizenship? Well, the U.S. District Court ruled on this and said that the people of Taiwan are stateless. Um, I know for a fact that um, people of Taiwan carrying ROC passports are not able to travel to every country. Some countries, you, you get there and it's like you have, I'm, I live in Maryland, it's like you show up with a passport from Maryland and the, pa the passport control people say, I'm sorry, you're not coming in here, you know, get a passport from a country and then come back. Uh, so when you, when you are stateless and your passport is not recognized um, by countries around the world, it, it interferes with your ability, uh, your ability to travel. Sure, the ROC, I mean, the ROC believes it's a government. The rest of the world disagrees with that, except I think there are four or five islands in the Caribbean, somewhere in the world, that recognize the ROC as a government. Nobody else does. And, and that's why the people have, are stateless. I mean, it, if what you're saying was true, the, um, there would be no big question of who owns Taiwan. So I hope that answers the question. Anyone else? Yes, sir. You. you. 
So other than the uh, political questions doctrine, what kind of arguments do, ex do you expect from the defense on this case? Good question. The, uh, I think the political question doctrine is, is obviously uh, the main concern and we, we've tried to deal with that as best we can. There's no question that we're correct on the facts. I mean, we have researched it. We've had people, I've had people at the um, National Archives for months. Uh, we've also spent significant, you know, hundreds of hours researching uh, all these issues uh, through original documents at the Library of Congress. Um, I mean, there's just, there's no question. Every sentence in the complaint has a footnote, um, and we have all the documents to support it. We're not, you know, we're very careful conservative drafters. We don't stretch anything. I mean, that's a rule in our firm is you don't, you don't stretch something because somebody's going to look at it and then you lose credibility. So we, are, we know we are right on the facts and we're right on the law. There's no, uh, there's no doubt that, this, that the right of self-determination exists and there's no doubt that the people there haven't been able to exercise it. So if I were on the other side, um, you might argue standing. Uh, I guess that would be another one. They would say, well, you know, the people, the plaintiffs, they didn't all have their uh, citizenship taken away, um, you know, in 1946. Um, uh, the t TCG is acting as a representative of its members who were affected by the law. Um, for example, the ABA, the American Bar Association, files lawsuits all the time um, on behalf of uh, members um, in a representative capacity. There's a, it's, it's not a class action suit, but you know, an organization that is created to uh, exert the rights of its members have standing to assert those rights in court. And so I, I think the standing argument would be a very weak argument, but I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, if they make that. They made it in the first Dr. Lin case, uh, and then they promptly dropped it when I cited a bunch of cases that showed that, yeah, we can do this. And so that, that argument was never heard from again. So. We'll have to wait and see. They have 60 days uh, to answer. Um, they could ask for an extension. The ROC has not yet been served. Um, they'll be served in the next couple of days. The U.S. government has, was served uh, a couple of days after the case was filed. Yes, ma'am. Or. Regarding the tangible uh, deliverables, you said they would be able to uh, vote on what nationalities they want to have. What will be the options? Uh, Japan, the US, would that be Taiwan or ROC or even PRC? It can be anything they, they want. It, it, I think it would, it would be open. You know, it's, it's not for me to say what choices they might want to exercise but it's a question of voting to decide. It's, about, it's a question of having the right to vote to decide uh, what your nationality is going to be. So it's not, that's, that's not my, I'm not trying to make everybody Japanese or Taiwanese or Chinese or any, anything else. It's a question of um, giving them the right to vote. You know, we, everybody has their own view, their own personal view about what they want to be and they should have that right uh, to uh, express that. And that's not something that they've well, had. Well, after the voting, that the result will, uh, will reflect their identity, like in their own view, what people they are. Right. But would the governments of the countries they want to be a part of recognize that they are a citizen of that country? It's up to that country to decide how to deal with it. Um, if, if um, I forget the exact total population now of, of Taiwan, it's 20 something million, as I recall, you know, if, um, 15 million say they want to be Japanese, I'm sure that Japan will notice. We have time for one more question. Hmm. I have one question from Twitter, unless someone in the audience would like to, to trump and take the last question. Um, a member internationally is seeking uh, just some additional comments on why U.S. jurisdiction, you know, why the courts here? Uh, the U.S. government is based here, for one thing, and in term, under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, which is the law that you have to follow when you're suing a foreign sovereign, and for, uh, there's a, and for, 
purposes of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, the ROC is considered a sovereign solely for purposes of, of um, uh, if there's, it, let me be clear, there, we have a law that says um, for purposes of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, the ROC shall be treated as if it were a sovereign. It's not recognized as a sovereign, but so we have to follow the uh, Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act and the default location for suing foreign sovereigns in the United States is Washington, D.C. So the principal is the U.S. government. They're based here. The default location for suing foreign sovereigns is Washington, D.C., so this is the place to be. Thank you. On behalf of Maduras Global, we'd like to thank the National Press Club for hosting us today. I would also like to thank Mrs. Lynn, all the plaintiffs, and their attorney, Mr. Camp. Um, for members of the press, uh, Mr. Camp and Mrs. Lynn will be available together afterward for additional questions or interviews. And of course, you're welcome to uh, follow up with me as well, and I can direct accordingly. Um, thank you all for coming today, and please help yourself to some last little treats in the back. Thank you.